as a Christian, though I don't think a necessarily a critically thinking one, I immediately sort of uh, fell for what I thought were quite compelling arguments. And for several years was more or less, I, I suppose, a Christian socialist. I wasn't a Marxist. I didn't believe in violent revolution. But I, I thought something vaguely like this, OK? Um, Christians ought to be concerned about the poor and poverty, all right? Premise one. Premise two, socialists talk a lot about the poor and poverty, right? Conclusion, Christians ought to be socialists. So what I really want to do this evening is talk about three of the myths, chosen more or less at random, but which I think might be relevant to those of us here. And I want to make clear that I, I don't think uh, that capitalism is the biblical or the Christian uh, economic system. I, it's, it's nowhere near that simple. I think you can be a good Christian and, and be a socialist. Uh, I think you can be a good socialist. You can be a socialist, at least, probably, and go to heaven. You'll just be in the sort of bad economic section of heaven, I think, you know. <laughs> and, and I think probably be rehearsing these myths over and over uh, for eternity. So I, I don't think it's that simple. Nevertheless, I do think that the basic Christian worldview lends itself uh, to capitalism. In fact, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, I would argue, actually contributed to the rise of capitalism and, the free, and economic freedom in the West. Uh, and that most of our sort of moral misgivings uh, have to do with misconceptions. All right, so I'm just going to focus on three of these myths uh, this evening. First one is the one I call the piety myth. Uh, and the piety myth is, you know, if you've studied any economics, this is not hard stuff, but the piety myth is essentially forgetting the so-called law of unintended consequences, or rather ignoring unintended consequences and trade-offs, and putting most of the moral weight on our, our intentions our motivations for a policy rather on than on the unintended and secondary consequences of the policy. This is such an important point that an econ economic journalist named Hen Henry Hazlitt wrote a book uh, in the 1950s called Economics in One Lesson. He actually defines what he calls the art of economics this way. Here's what he says. He says, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy not merely for one group, but for all groups. And notice that Hazlitt's talking about the art of economics, sort of a craft. It's something that you learn, that you get embedded in your intuitions. He's not talking about the science of economics. Of course, there's aspects of economics that are predictive, that are properly described as a social science. But that, that also frightens a lot of people. They think, well, there's no way I can really understand this stuff unless I take a lot of economics courses. And I, and I remember that macro course I had in college. It was terrible. It was dismal. It was abysmal. And you don't want to hear about it. But the reality is that might be true if you want the science of economics. But I would maintain that the art of economics is actually just thinking really carefully about unintended consequences and various consequences of various policies. It's just thinking really, really hard. And it doesn't require a whole lot other than really well-tutored common sense and an above average intelligence. The problem isn't that we're not smart enough to get these things, it's just that we tend not to do this. We tend to go straight from our moral intuitions into some particular policy without refracting those intuitions through this kind of consideration. I call this the piety myth after a quote by a 20th century French philosopher named Etienne Gilson, who famously said, piety is no substitute for technique. Now, what was his point? Well, piety, of course, is the state of our hearts, right? It's, it's the state of our, our motives and uh, our orientation toward God. Now, in terms of your state before God, your intentions, right, your piety is relevant. Right? Both what we do and why we do it is morally important. But why we do something is not important when it comes to economics, when it comes to public policy. Only what we do is important. And if we actually want to help people, right, then if we have to choose, wouldn't we rather have people that implement good or helpful policy for bad reasons than people that implement bad policies for good reasons? Or we might be concerned about the legislator souls that do that. Right? But we ought to focus our attention and our sort of moral reasoning on the consequences of policy and not on the intentions of those who advocate that policy. Self-interest is not the same as selfishness. Right? Every time you take a breath, eat a meal, take your vitamins, right? go to sleep on time, obey your parents, you act in your self-interest. Right? When you get to work on time, you act and this, your interest and the interest, perhaps, of your children. Those are self-interested acts. They are not immoral acts. In fact, they're praiseworthy. 
All right? Remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Self-love, rightly oriented, is actually the basis for our altruism toward others. So self-interest and acting in our self-interest is not by definition immoral. And I think much of what Smith was arguing is that point, that the butcher, the brewer, the baker can simply pursue his narrow interests, his goals, you know, making some money, paying his rent, feeding his children. He doesn't have to think about, you know, the, the good uh, of, of others. He simply has to be pursuing his narrow goals. But in a market, right, in a free market system, to pursue those, he has to have an other regarding consideration. He has to say, okay, to make money, right, I can't steal from my neighbor. So if I'm going to get money from my neighbor, I have to think, what could I provide for him that he would freely buy? And can I do it at a price that will, will be cheaper than my competitors, but will allow me to make a profit? So even if he is just narrowly concerned, he nevertheless has to think about the good of others in order to succeed, so that his private self-interest can channel itself into socially beneficial outcome. All right? This is a reality that economists all know, right? That economies, under certain conditions, the total amount of wealth can go up. That means that somebody could get a big slice of the pie. They didn't necessarily take it from someone else. Someone might end up with a very large slice of the pie, but the pie much, might be much larger. So that even those with a smaller percentage end up with a bigger piece than they had before. That's still win-win. And I think that's the sort of arrangement we should want. Now, what I think is interesting about this point is not only that we sort of know this economically, but that it's the sort of thing that an economist, as an economist, can't necessarily account for, but that I think the Judeo-Christian tradition actually expects. If you presuppose the Judeo-Christian view of the human person, right, we're created in God's image. The only creatures who are created in the image of the creator God. God calls the universe into existence out of nothing, right? We're not creators like that with capital C. Nevertheless, we are image bearers of that same God. That means, I think, in part, is that that image allows us to take the material universe that God has given, it, given us and to transform it into things that weren't there before. Take sand and turn it into computer uh, chips and fiber optic cables. We take the material substrate and we create wealth, and in higher and higher tech economies, the mind part of the wealth comes to predominate over the matter part of the wealth. We create wealth that wasn't there before, and in fact, I think we even create new resources.